10th anniversary celebration. So join us to celebrate 10 years of impact, resilience, and excellence in broadcasting. Uh, we've seen the fantastic highs and the challenging lows and uh, everything in between. Uh, but we just want to say thank you to you, our cherished listener, for sticking with us, for staying with us. And the best days of our partnership uh, is here and there is more uh, to come. We have another conversation coming up, like I've been telling you. Uh, Professor Bafo Ajimandria has joined us in the studio. We know Professor Bafo Ajimandria is very keen on governance, of course. Uh, he has expertise in that field. He's worked with the United Nations um, among the many, many other portfolios that he's filled. He's currently the CEO of the J.A. Kofo Foundation. And we're excited that he's joined us here in the studio. Prof, good morning. Good morning, Lantam. Well, welcome, Prof. How are you doing? Very well, and thanks for having me. Yes. And since I heard it is your 10th anniversary, I have to congratulate you and your colleagues for doing such a great job over the past 10 years. Thank you very much, Prof. Yes. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, yes. we, appreciate, we appreciate the congratulations. Yes. And uh, well, one would say, where, where, where have you been hiding and what have you been up to? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm not a guy who hides at all. <laughs> I'm always in the public domain. Yeah. Uh, many other uh, media houses invite me, and I, de I do express myself strongly on yes. issues of national uh, significance and importance. So I've been around, and I'm just happy that I'm here to continue that uh, self-imposed yeah. uh, assignment. Mm. You know, ele elections are just around the corner. We have barely four months uh, before we go to the polls to go and vote. How, what, what is your, view, your, your general view of what the political climate is looking like? We've got all the political party, yeah. well, well, the so two main people right, campaigning all over party. the places. Yeah, yeah, we have yeah. Alan, you know, mm -hmm. also campaigning. We have mm -hmm. Cheddar campaigning. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. things are being said here and there. Mm -hmm. I mean, even before we really get down to the issues, your general overview of the political climate currently. Well, uh, what I'm seeing now is not different from what I've seen over the past 30 years of our full republic. Mm. Anytime we approach elections, uh, we have political parties being very active. And occasionally we hear people who misspoke or uh, who, uh, for all kinds of reasons, would make claims that are not realistic. Uh, but that is politics. And so far, thank God, there have been no nasty uh, incident mm. in terms of violence at any of the campaigns. And I'm hoping and praying that continues. Uh, we are locked into a political system that requires uh, politicians and parties to compete yeah. for power. And normally when there's a competition, you are bound to find some tension and all. And so in that respect, what is happening is not new to me. Mm -hmm. I'm just hoping that they maintain this kind of uh, peaceful approach to the elections. Mm. But, but you believe in the system. I mean, we've been practicing the system properly um, since the inception of the Fourth Republic. You know, this, this kind of politics that we've been doing in yeah. a multi-party yeah. democracy. And this is where we are. Mm -hmm. As a country, uh, we are not in a very, very good position mm -hmm. in terms of the well-being of the general citizenry. Yeah. So, and, and as we've done it over these years, do you, do, you, do, you, do you believe that this is the best system for us? <laughs> there is nothing <laughs> like the best system anywhere in the world. Yeah. Uh, political systems, uh, many types. You have uh, autocracies, totalitarianism, we have communism, socialism. And of course, we have democracy. Uh, Winston, uh, Winston Churchill is the one who said it quite beautifully that uh, democracy is the worst form of government <laughs> except for all the others. Mm. So in other words, it's not the best, but, but amongst the lot the that others. we have is the best. Yeah. So we cannot run away from that. And mm. for Ghana, with our experience uh, prior to the Fourth Republic, where we had incessant uh, uh, military interventions and all kinds of things we didn't like, mm. I think nobody wants to go back to either dictatorship or authoritarianism or military rule or any such uh, type of government. Yeah. So even though we are having serious challenges with the way we are practicing democracy, it's the only one we got. Mm. But we have a duty to make sure we enhance the practice, we perfect it, we improve it, mm. so that it become more and more relevant to our needs. Right. And I've been still talking about the political climate, as you were, you know, talking about earlier. We've heard the people on the uh, platform saying all kinds of things. You're happy that there hasn't been any, you know, violence, uh, people getting hurt and all of that. But things are being said. Things are being said. For example, recently, um, the Greek minister has come under very, very heavy criticism 
and condemnation for saying that, I mean, any means necessary we're going to use to win the election. And we're not handing over power to the NDC today or tomorrow. If anybody doesn't understand, they should go and bend the sea. And then we have, you know, the NDC responding, saying if he's a man, he should say that he will not hand over power. We will tell you that when iron meets iron, you see fire. You know, and all of these comments, comments. what goes through your mind when you hear things like this in this, in this uh, political season? Well, perhaps because of my familiarity with these kinds of uh, statements and how politicians conduct, conduct themselves, I just laugh it off. Because there's nothing to convince me that any party losing the elections will be able to just keep power. I don't see it happening. Uh, but the, 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 the troubling part is when you, someone makes that kind of statement, it leads to a, a provocation mm -hmm. and a response from the other side. And that potentially can create a problem for us. So in fact, we do not need anyone to, to, to kind of tease or poke fun or to, to make statements that lead to a, a kind of a quick uh, reaction mm. uh, in a violent way. So in that respect, I was not pleased at all that uh, Brian, a very nice gentleman, I know him, he knows me, uh, I, I was disturbed that he will make this statement. And what was more disturbing for me, that the last statement he made was not the first one. He yeah. made one or two previously. Yeah, I mean, uh, so he's sort of reiterating the same exactly. sentiment, but doubling down uh, exactly. on it. And I think his party leaders or elders should sit him down and advise him that uh, that is not part of a mature politician. Look, we've traveled this far. Thank God we haven't seen any serious bloodshed. Mm. Nonetheless, after every election, we get some form of violence. Yeah. People, a few people die, mm -hmm. almost in every election. Yeah. But because uh, these incidents do not uh, get out of control, we're able to control them. Uh, we think all is always fine. That's not the case. So I think any statement that will provoke uh, such reactions, we should seek to uh, stop it. And that's why I think the party elders in both parties or whoever is in control of these parties, should declare some kind of code of conduct because this upcoming election certainly poses difficult challenges. Mm. You see, the incumbent government party uh, would like to break the eight, as they say, because it's never happened before. Yeah. And therefore, it will be interesting to see how they break it. And that will bring some tension. In the same way, the opposition, leading opposition party, the NDC, believes that uh, this cycle of eight-year turnover yeah. should continue. Yeah. So it's now their turn. Mm -hmm. So anything that uh, doesn't reflect that possibility, they may look at it with some suspicious eyes. And that's why I think they are putting the Electoral Commission on so much pressure. And I think the Electoral Commission should stand up and, uh, and uh, do what is needful by mm -hmm. being transparent and being very uh, open and uh, uh, accountable in terms of what is expected of it so that both parties, all parties, all stakeholders can see that truly uh, the Electoral Commission is not doing any under, underhanded uh, uh, things to, mm -hmm. to, to, to really take the shine away from uh, the electoral process that has been going on for the past 30 years. So I think that the, the burden is on all of us the Electoral Commission doing its part and being open and transparent with the political parties and all of us, mm -hmm. the parties themselves also being careful not simply to give a dog a bad name and hang it, you know, because if you continuously say that EC is plotting to 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 to, to rig the election, to rig the election yeah. then we have a term uh, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. But how do you find the conduct of the EC, you know, recently and how uh, they've, they've handled themselves? so far? Overall, I think they've been trying hard and it's good. Except that like late, the latest information or uh, news I got was that uh, they've not been able to release the provisional register, yeah. which is uh, supposed to have been released uh, this week or something like that. In mm -hmm. other words, they were not able to meet a deadline yeah. in the electoral uh, calendar. Yeah. And for me, if a day or two to the deadline, there are signs that you cannot meet it. What you do 
is to hold a press conference to invite the parties. We have an IPAC, I, I guess, and let them know why you are not meeting the deadline. If you do that, it will immediately, immediately diffuse any suspicions mm -hmm. on anybody's part. But if you wait till the day and then you say, oh, sorry, we cannot release it, then people with suspicious minds begin to think, oh, why? Why is he hiding from us? You know? And that's what I think the EC should seek to overcome. Whenever there's a need for any change on the calendar, please mm -hmm. be proactive and just uh, announce to the public or to the parties that, look, this has happened because of that. This cannot occur. And I think we are all reasonable people. We can understand that. Uh, there's a popular saying, uh, we will something and God disposes, right? Yeah. So, so we may will for something, but uh, it can go out of control. So I think being transparent and being proactive in terms of uh, these kinds of issues to the EC, that would be the best way to address the at times needless suspicions that most people have about the EC. Mm. But um, I mean, coming back to you know, the things that people, politicians say on, on, on these platforms, in, in, in your experience, what, what is it that will make you know, the politicians say or pass certain comments that are incendiary? It's not the first time that we've seen it, right? Yes, we've yes. seen it over the years, you know, yes. and, and sometimes it's been, it's been quite chaotic because of some of the utterances that come out of the politicians' mouths. And they continue, each and every political cycle, mm -hmm. to say things like this. So from, from, from where you say, where does all of that come from? Is there a particular, I don't know. Remedy. <laughs> <laughs> is there a particular system, yeah, yeah. you know, that, that mm -hmm. makes or predisposes these politicians to want to, or they just get happier and excited when they see their crowd? Well, that's part of it. In <laughs> fact, when they stand before the crowd, uh, I think they get possessed <laughs> by all kinds of spirits. Mm. They begin to feel superhuman, they begin to feel like with the crowd there, we, are, we have what it takes to win. And therefore, to cheer up the crowd, they, they attempted to make statements, like you said, incendiary statements, and uh, they say things that are needless. You know? mm. So that is that. But you see, that is inherent in the political system that we have. When you have a competitive politics, as democracy, multi-party yeah. democracy prescribes, yeah. Yeah. then certainly uh, all parties vying for power will have to be, you know, I'm not saying they should misbehave that way by making needless statements, but they, it makes the competition keen because, and what is worse with our system is that we have what we call the winner takes all. Yeah. It's not an inclusive kind of governance that we have. So if you win by just one majority vote, uh, one vote it becomes a 51 to 49, you take over everything of the state and you control the state and you govern for four years. Not <laughs> giving any recognition at all to the fact that the other side won 49. Any party with 49% of support in, the, in any country is quite a dominable, I mean, uh, yeah. a dominating party. And yeah. uh, to put it aside for four years, I don't think is the right thing to do. That's why more and more people are beginning to question the winner-takes-all system. Mm -hmm. South Africa, their constitution allows them to have what you call coalition government. So if a party doesn't get majority, yeah. everybody has to come bring in. Everybody in. They yeah. wait to that level to, to be inclusive. So for the first time in 30 years, the ANC not getting the majority. Now we see that everybody yeah, is in a, government. Freedom Party, the Democratic uh, Alliance by the white folks in that country. So I think we need to seriously think about our system and see what can be done to reduce the tension and maybe to avoid this high-pitched competitiveness when yeah. it comes to politics. And I think there are some interesting ideas that are emerging. I've been advocating for a review of the Constitution that will uh, maybe bring us together in a more unified way as a nation rather than this uh, competitive and divisive politics that we have. Mm. I mean, is that to say perhaps maybe if <laughs> there is an NDC uh, president, he appoints an MPP minister somewhere, CPP minister somewhere? Uh, that would be one way of inclusive <laughs> governance, but that is not going to work. Actually, yeah. <laughs> I just read a piece by my colleague, uh, Professor Kwasi Prempe mm. at CDD, which I think is very enlightening. You see, most of us think that democratic practice is like a straitjacket. Once you put it on, mm -hmm. nothing should change. Yeah. But that is not 
the case. Like we do it this way, and this is how we how do, we do it, it. You know, lawyers have that kind of mindset, and I hope uh, they understand what I mean. It's not <laughs> negative. Yeah, their education of lawyers gives them a certain mindset regarding the law. One is the law. One is the constitution. You do not touch it. Yeah. Unless, of course, there's an overwhelming uh, reason to, 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 to change it. To change it. Yeah. Otherwise, they want to stick to that. But good governance does not go by that kind of precept. Mm -hmm. you know? The beauty about democracy that oftentimes we all forget is that it allows you the flexibility to change things to suit your environment. I'm not talking about pettiness and changing things randomly. No. Uh, democracy, I've said it many times, has two sides. The principal democracy is the universal values that all human beings, by virtue of being human beings, you deserve. Right. That is issues of freedom, liberty, uh, participation, accountability. These are all precepts written deep into democracy. But when it comes to the practice, you are at liberty to craft the institutions and structures that will suit your unique circumstance. Mm -hmm. So the, that's why you move from Ghana to Britain to United States to Germany. You find some very interesting differences in the way democratic practice uh, occurs. Yeah. Okay? It's not a straight jacket. So in that sense, for 30 years, we have seen how this competitiveness to get to the Jubilee House has been tearing us apart. Yeah, plus the winner takes all. Plus the winner takes all. So the idea that Kwesi wrote, which I, I really like, mm -hmm. is, it, it falls right into my own thinking. That, look, we can have a, a parliament elected, but the presidency, we don't have to have an election for the president. So that you can have the executive that is non-partisan, but checked by a uh, legislature mm -hmm. that is partisan. Mm -hmm. You see, so we're talking about innovating our governance. Yeah. And we have a lot of evidence behind us to think about this, to be innovative, to be creative in how we practice democracy in such ways that it will not be uh, a, a, block, a standing block for development. Look, Every four years of uh, eight years that we change government, do you know the cost in terms of our, uh, our economy, the mm -hmm. cost of the economy? Mm -hmm. Because most of the things, policies that the previous government had in place may be jettisoned yeah. by the new government. And they come and try and implement new things altogether. Exactly. Because they want to be sure that people will identify that party or that leader with certain projects. Yeah to help them win again. Mm -hmm. The Americans can afford to do that because they've been around 250 years eh? or 300 years and their economy is strong and is not built on government. The economy of America is not based on the government. Mm -hmm. It's based on private enterprise. So whether Biden comes and goes or Trump comes and goes, essentially the economy is there. It's just the policies that this government might introduce that may mm -hmm. uh, compel the economy to behave in certain ways. But ultimately, it comes back. But we are a developing country. Our economy is a dependent economy. We rely almost exclusively on foreign charity. Mm -hmm. We donors. Now, for 17 times, we've gone to the IMF to be bailed out. So when somebody says, if I come to power, I'm going to renegotiate the IMF. Great. Because I want a, a breathing space mm -hmm. to, be, to be able to borrow again. <laughs> but the borrowing is a problem. But you see, if you come in on that partisan line, certainly you have to do that to be able to uh, establish your legitimacy in terms of uh, being a, a government or a party that delivers. So we are forced to borrow. But the critical issues we are facing is not that. We need to find a way to build an economy that is self-sufficient in things that we are capable of doing. Yeah. A champion had the idea of a self-reliance. Self-reliance. And there are so many aspects of our lives that can be made self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. Food production, rice production, 
plantain production, mm -hmm. onion production, carrot production. But it's like we know these things. We right? know. But we, we are unable to do it. I mean, I remember the president, the current president, mm -hmm. one of the things he used to go on and on and on about is a Ghana beyond, beyond aid. aid. A Ghana beyond Which excited aid. me, I have yeah, to say. But, but what have they done? It's all because of the politics. Because if you don't get the money to do things, as Ghanaians are saying today, they will say you came four years, eight years. What did you do? Mm -hmm. So if we have a non-partisan executive, then this fear of taking certain decisions that may be in the short term better for us, but in the medium and long term will be great for the country. Such decisions cannot be taken. Because you are thinking of the party that brought mm -hmm. you to power and the need for you to sustain your party in power. And there are so many fundamental issues we need to address as a people, mm -hmm. which we are not because of politics. And, 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 and you have only for eight years mm. to show your medal. And, and on that score, I mean, a lot of promises are being made, you know, by these politicians uh, when they mount the campaign platforms. Uh, we're hearing promises of all kinds of taxes going to be scrapped. We'll scrap oh. E-levy, we'll scrap that levy, we'll scrap this levy. Um, we're hearing promises of we're going to pay free tuition for all level 100 students. We're hearing promises of um, we're going to enable um, you to be able to buy mobile phones and then you pay, you know, little by little. I mean, we're hearing all kinds of, uh, some would describe them as wild campaign promises. Um, how, do you, how do you view that? You know, juxtaposing it to what we've just been talking about, you know, as in what the country actually needs, juxtaposing it to the kinds of promises that, that they are making. They are, they, are, they, are, they are making. You see, unfortunately, it, it's a, a bit uh, paradoxical. In the kind of competition they are in, naturally, they have to make some promises. Mm. The question becomes whether these are realistic promises or not. Mm. But they have to make some promises. Mm. And I wish. They can make promises that make sense, that will not overburden the economy that is already uh, reeling. But they have to make it because they have to convince people what? They are afraid to promise the critical issues that need to be done because in four years they cannot do it. And unfortunately, we have a citizen, citizenry that is not overwhelmingly sophisticated. In the rural communities, they want to hear that you give me free school, you give me free, free everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> if uh, Ghanaians have their way, everything, will be everything free. should be free. Yeah. Including the clothes that you are wearing. <laughs> People will appreciate that. Yeah. We're very excited about the free electricity and free water. Precisely. <laughs> so they'll promise it. Yeah. But the thing is, this is not the first time they are promising this. Mm -hmm. I remember when the NPP was in opposition, Mahama was in power. They were referring to certain taxes as nuisance taxes. You yes. remember? Yes. And promised to remove them when they came to power. Yes. Of course, they did remove some of them, if not all. But in the end, what did they do? They realized that they had shortchanged themselves so, in terms of revenue mobilization. So some other taxes had to come. So and they had to. Those ones. Exactly. So if somebody promises, I will take up the e levy, mind you, that in power, they will be hit with the reality. Even if they took the e-levy away, something else will, be, will come in to replace it. Because the government, as we speak, we are bankrupt the country. And in fact, you cannot even go easily to the euro bond as they used to do to raise funds because we have hit the ceiling. We are almost insolvent. So if you are promising things that still will take a chunk of your revenue, like making education free or making uh, tertiary education free or first year free or whatever, it's money. Of course, you can cut the waste here and there, but I'm not sure whether cutting waste in government, if they have the courage to do it in the first place, will be able to sustain uh, such a freebie that you want to give to young people. So in a way, I don't blame them, because as I keep saying, the system really uh, permits them to, uh, to promise. Mm. But you and I know that we have seen these promises over the years, mm -hmm. most of them are not met. Uh, and even they are met, they are met at a very high cost to the country, to the economy. You see, like when the, the present government introduced the free uh, education, mm -hmm. which all of us love, 
But in the end, we all saw the extent to which it was eating up our revenues. That's why at one point, even the finance minister at the time, Ken Oforiata, suggested that the implementation should be a bit discriminatory. Mm -hmm. People who can afford let them pay and those who can cannot, we take care of it. Yeah. In the same way, in my humble view, those who are promising uh, tuition waivers for first year universities, mm -hmm. there are some who can afford. Don't tell me every university student or only Ghanaian who 100% uh, of young people who want to enter university are indigenous. In other words, uh, they, they don't have the means to enter. Some do have the means. But if we were to have a system that tells us that this family, this kid coming from this home, blah, 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 mm. uh, their income s simply cannot allow them. So uh, they need to be supported. I think that would be a more rational way mm -hmm. when your economy is already unproductive mm. and we are not creating wealth, but rather we are promoting uh, expenditures. Any country that wants to build itself with foreign charity <laughs> will collapse, mm. will fail. You cannot build your country on the basis of foreign charity. Loan is charity in a way. And if you take a loan 30 years to pay, you are gone. Your children, children, children mm -hmm. are going to yeah, we're uh, even inherit paying that with high interest rates. Exactly. You know. So I think our leaders, our political leaders should be conscious of this. Put the nation first. Let us know the bitter, uh, what you call, uh, plans that we need to embark upon in order to gradually win ourselves or limit our over-dependency on foreign charity. But in all of this, how should we as Ghanaians, whom these politicians who mount their political platforms to speak to, to try and uh, convince to vote for them, how should we be receiving their messages? And what should we be looking out for? What should we, what actions yeah. should we be taking when we see them, we hear them make all of these promises. And even when they come into government, and one year, two years, three years down the line into the uh, government, we see that, ah, they were just lying to us. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a tough question, Elantham. But you see, politicians are very smart individuals. They are very smart. They know the mood of their people. They know how the people think and behave politically, and they use that to strategize to win power. A leading politician once said that uh, Ghanaians have short memory. <laughs> uh, yeah, somebody also, most of them think that Ghanaians, all you need to do is to promise them an election time pass uh, $50, 50 CD notes. Yeah. Or uh, in the olden days, you buy bentoa or something like bentois. that, a, a bag of rice or bag salt rice, and all. oil. Oil. All of those things. And yeah. it's still going on in some rural communities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But the politicians still yes, do even T-shirts. T-shirts. Even T-shirts. Yes, yeah. you see. And they do this because, to a large extent, to a very large extent, because of the poverty of people. At times, too, it's not just material poverty mm. with T-shirts as a response, but oftentimes it's mental poverty. You see, people's thinking have not been truly affected by whatever that they've learned. Mm. So if somebody tells you, uh, I, I will do this for you, and you think seriously about it, you have to question whether what he or she wants to do for you is what is necessary mm. for the society to progress. Many people don't think that way. I think in a way we are all inward looking. We are selfish in a way. So what I want to chop today is yeah. what is of interest to me. Yeah. They are not, we are yeah. all not thinking of the future. And I think the politicians by and large are doing the same. Because if they were thinking of the future of this country, their vision would be more futuristic. Mm -hmm. See, they can tell us, hey, now we are burdened by this indebtedness. Uh, we need to reduce our dependency on them. And due to that, I think uh, maybe instead of constructing 100, uh, 100 kilometer road this year, we cannot. If we do that, we dig ourselves deeper into the hole. So maybe we should do only 10 kilometers. You see, that communi communicating the problems of Ghana looks to like Ghanaians. the politicians are afraid of doing that. Yeah, because they are more after the power and what they can get out of it mm. than what will sustain this nation into the future. Mm. I don't see them 
uh, being interested in what happens to us in the future. That is why I've come to that believe that we need to find a way to uh, do away with partisanship, at least at the legislative level. So we can all look with the same binoculars, looking down there into the stars, and what we can do to bring this country back to uh, sanity in terms of the path that we've chosen. Mm. So far as we continue this high-pitched divisiveness at the executive level, everybody chasing after power, it's going to be difficult for us to be futuristic in our outlook. Mm. And how, how do we get there? How do we get to the point where we are more futuristic in our outlook? How, how do we improve our democracy? How do we get better? I can tell you right away, we need to seriously look at the Constitution. Some mm. people disagree. Because I know very powerful people who have agreed that for 30 years you have been having democracy, you haven't had any problems, so the Constitution has been good for us. Mm -hmm. Forgetting that what this person is talking about is simply electoral democracy. Mm -hmm. We have succeeded in changing government every four years or retaining government every four years. Mm -hmm. Peacefully, by and large. Peacefully, by and large. By and large. Okay? Yeah. So we think that's all. But we are not looking at the other side of democracy, which is the dividends that should come. What benefits are What we benefits, have? material, economically speaking. Yeah. You see, they, are, they detach themselves from uh, the fact that Ghana, like most developing countries, our economies are tied to the global economy in a very, very demeaning way. For the Western countries, it's in, in their interest to keep Ghana where it is, being a raw material producer. Being raw material producer. Of course, our governments from time to time do come up with the idea of uh, processing and uh, adding value. They say it. But in, in, in real terms, what is it? We have been producing cocoa for 180 years or 140 years. We still export raw cocoa. Yeah. And if it, the funny thing is that the government has made, these laws are made to make Ghana government the sole uh, uh, buyer of the cocoa. buyer of cocoa in the Korea. You can't sell anywhere else. Yes. Yeah. And they do this very strangely by going out every year to contract $1.5 billion dollars loan. Syndicated loan. Syndicated loan. Yeah. You come and use that to buy to the buy, cocoa. And then go and sell. And go and sell. And then get the money. And get the money. Come back. Come back. <laughs> the, and then say that we are in debt. <laughs> and then the process is repeated. It's repeated. It's and if your head is on, you have your head sitting on your shoulders mm. and thinking, over the years, we could have saved the 1.5 billion from the sales that uh, we make. The mm. profit, we could have been saving it to the point where we would have had $1.5 billion in our account, which we'll use as our own money to buy the cocoa. Mm. Then we can begin to treat farmers better. But now, as I speak to you, we, are, we understand that even the uh, uh, cocoa board is in debt. Yeah. How do you get in debt? You see, so I think there's so many things wrong with the system that we have created. I mean, we are the sixth largest producer of gold in the world. Yes. But... Where are we with regard to... We say that and we are happy. We are, getting. We, are the, we are the number one producer of gold in Africa. Africa. Behind South Africa. That's right. I mean, in, ahead of South Africa, uh, ahead yeah. of Mali. Yes. And we are happy with that ranking. Yeah. That's all. Producing a lot of gold. How much do we get? Yeah. How much do we get? I've been following closely the recent uh, so-called opening of a refinery after 100 years or more of yes. digging gold. Yes. And then even there are some controversies, whether this is the first refinery somewhere. I mean, there are a number of refineries yeah. out there. So and they, they, not they are not functioning. One. Yeah. So why do we come out around. to say we have the f first uh, refinery when even we haven't gotten the certification from the global uh, <laughs> actors in terms of your ability to, to refine and sell it on the world market? We mm -hmm. haven't gotten that yet. If that had been a priority for us as a people, this could have been done maybe mm. 50 years ago. I mean, and even with that, I mean, organizations like Imani are raising, you know, issues about the composition of the company and, well, you know, uh, how much money uh, the people who are supposed to own it are bringing in, how much government is actually going to own, who the other holder. I mean, a whole lot of issues and, and, are, and listen, are, are, are rising as a result. If gold of that. is a precious mineral, yeah. 
supposed to give us much revenue to run our country. Mm. Why can't government have some kind of plan, strategy, to own the refinery? So Ghana is not capable of raising two billion, I don't know the cost of setting up a, a refinery. Well, with all this new one, we, we've been told that it's for us. But then... But the foreigners the are... Foreigners, some, some, uh, it's not <laughs> for us. Uh, somebody's investing yeah, in it. Somebody's investing in it, but uh, eventually we're going to have, you know, about uh, 20%. Oh, there we go again. You know, stake they come it. and dig gold. Yeah. We take 10 or 12% at the moment, and they take it yeah. the rest away. We have even been told by money that eventually it is our government which will still end up financing, you know, the entire thing anyway. No, there's so much wrong <laughs> with the way our leaders uh, lead us into these kinds of predicaments. Where we have the, uh, what do you call, com 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 comparative advantage we we blow it by dubious contracts and dubious arrangements with the external uh, investors and in the in the in the in the end we we get literally nothing you see that's why i think there's a need for us to really reassess governance mm -hmm. if there were to be an independent body a national body that oversees these kind of matters, taking it away from the politicians. I think we can begin to see results in many of the sectors that we have. Because once you politicize everything, and once politicians look at power as a means to enrich themselves, to create wealth, private wealth, then these behaviors will continue. You know? So I think it's part of the reason why I think we need to reassess uh, governance, we need to reassess democratic practice by making sure that, in fact, certain vital decisions are not made by the tiny minority in government. That is uh, the president and his cabinet. Mm. Th that is too much power to give. Literally, saying our destiny is in your hands. Yeah, we give it to you. We give it to Run you. Run affairs. Run affairs. Yeah. And let's all be happy. Then in the end, you get into contracts, and this is not only this government. In fact, all the governments we have had, the behavior is the same, okay? Because after all, they all rule under the same system that we have created. Yeah, they all have the same powers. The they same powers, the ex exactly. Same executive powers. Precisely. Yeah. So I think we need to revisit governance and how we structure uh, power, political power, national power, in such a way that our destiny is controlled not just by a handful of people, but uh, by society at large, through their representative. Of course, one can argue parliament is there to, to check uh, on, the, on the government. Uh, 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 loans are reviewed by parliament. We all know that. Yeah. But over the past 30 years, how effective has that been, especially if you have a majority in the parliament? This is the first time we have a hung parliament. Mm. Previously, nothing like that. So how effective, effectively, that uh, we, 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 we check the government? So... That leads me to, again, say that we have to undertake a serious review of the Constitution. And this whole power concentration in, uh, in Accra, uh, we need to decentralize in the full sense of the word, political, administrative, and fiscal decentralization mm. so that we can empower people at the community level to begin to take charge of their, of their, of their development. Mm. You're still listening to The Morning Star here on Star 103.5 FM. My guest is Professor Bafo Achimandia. We have just about uh, eight minutes hmm. uh, to wrap it all up. Uh, but let me remind you that the University of Ghana School of Law is um, announcing that there are admissions for the next cohort of the ME and LLL programs. It's open and it will close till the 31st. Uh, it will close at the 31st of August 2024. So uh, get to the University of Ghana School of Law. They are offering you on parallel teaching and learning environment. Students benefit from the unique opportunity to attend summer schools at prestigious Ivy League institutions in the USA, as well as leading universities in England and other top-tier law schools, schools globally. And their international exposure sets the University of Ghana Law School apart, uh, providing students with a destructive edge in legal education and career prospects. So for more information, Call any of these numbers or bar can be reached on 055-137-1319. Vero can be reached on 053-128-2413. And Naomi can be reached on 053-133-0203. So join us at the University of Ghana School of Law 
and get a world-class legal education experience. Also, what can you remember from 15 years ago? Maybe you had just bought your first mobile phone, sent a text message via the internet for the very first time, or just discovered the ease of moving money around conveniently. Think back to all of those moments. Momo has been there for you. And guess what? Momo is 15 years old. And for the very first time, uh, from the very first time you send money to a loved one, paying bills effortlessly, enjoying the peace of mind that comes with secure, safe, and reliable transactions, it's been an amazing journey so far. So now get ready for some mouth-watering offers as we celebrate Momo at 15. Look out for our market storms and floats near you and win some mind-blowing prizes. Thank you, Ghana, for doing this with us. Download the My Momo app on the App Store or the Google Play Store and just Momo it everywhere you go. Uh, we'll get back to a conversation with uh, Prof here in uh, the studio as we're just uh, beginning to wrap it up. Um, so, Prof, um, before we go, in political communication, you know, what advice would you give to the politicians out there? I mean, recently, again, the um, running mate for Dr. Baumia has come under fire again after making the Kwame Nkrumah comment. Um, I think he was trying to remember Professor Mills's name and he said, uh, the way will not cry, your friend is Bakuna <laughs> will not cry, your friend is Before he mentioned Professor Mills's name and he's, he's, he's come under a lot of fire, you know. A word of advice for our politicians in their political communication during this, uh, yeah. this, this political season. I think the case you just cited uh, could happen to many other people. In the course of speaking, a name can easily elude you. Yeah. But of course, one can argue, how can you, a seasoned politician, forget the name of your president, your former president? That would be a fair question to put to the vice president, aspiring vice president for the NPP. Other than that, I can say that all of us, when you're speaking at times, uh, we just miss a name or miss a word or miss something. So in that respect, I won't fault him too much. But on the whole, I think it's very important for political leaders, those in the public domain seeking power, to always be alert to the fact that when they speak, everybody listens. It's not before. It's not like before. If you're a parliamentarian, uh, some people will even not listen when you are making an intelligent statement. Mm. But once you are a potential president, a vice president is potentially a president. Yeah. So once you are getting to that highly elevated uh, level in politics, you've got to be very conscious of everything you say, everything you do, and where you go. Unless, of course, as a people who have downgraded that position. Because these are in a very elevated social position. So I will simply hope that all of them, not just Napo alone, all of them should be mindful of the status that yeah. they are seeking. Yeah. And therefore, when you are talking to your people, which is all Ghanaians, even when you're on the platform talking to your party fanatics, you are talking to all of us. Because the position you are seeking will be a national position. Mm -hmm. So whether I'm your party or not, you are talking to me. And that consciousness, hopefully, will help them to be mindful and circumspect once they are making public statements. Perhaps that alertness hasn't come to them, mm. or in particular, uh, particularly to uh, Honorable uh, uh, Prempe, okay? Matthew Prempe. So I think hopefully with these kinds of uh, uh, backlashes coming, he will begin to be conscious of this. Other than that... Uh, He's going to embarrass himself all the time. Mm. And, um, and this is something that uh, someone wanted me to ask you uh, very quickly before we go. Um, judges are being vetted uh, to go to the Supreme Court. And the minority in parliament, you know, is, uh, is voting against nominating these two people that the president has nominated to, to, to go to the Supreme Court. So it brings up the conversation about the number of judges that we need. We have 15 currently. Uh, some of, two of them will be going on retirement very soon. If the two come, we'll have about 17 Supreme Court justices. Uh, the, the Chief Justice argues that there's a lot of work at the Supreme Court that needs to be done. And so perhaps we should go up to 20 and then cap it there. W what are your thoughts on all of these 
issues about judges, appointments of judges, yeah. how many judges we should have at the Supreme Court and all of that? In fact, years back when I was at CDD, I remember this topic coming up. Mm. And uh, you see, the, the court, uh, sorry, the constitution says no less than nine, yeah. but fails to place a ceiling. Yes. So any president, any time, can appoint Supreme Court ju uh, judges. And I think it's important we place a cap. And if you ask me how many, I would say let's place it at maximum 12. The argument that there's so much, the workload of the, for the judges is uh, over, overbearing and therefore we need to bring in more to use the, uh, the workload. I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a judge, so I, maybe I don't appreciate this kind of argument the way they do. But I also believe that there are certain issue cases that can be relegated to the lower courts. Not necessarily the Supreme Court, but I think in our constitution, we allow people to go straight to the Supreme Court on any flimsy matter. Mm. And that's why perhaps they were overworked, overloaded. I think certain cases must be placed at the level of the high court mm -hmm. and before appeal, appeal can bring it to the Supreme Court. You see, if you think of it, the United States is slightly different. It's a federal system, so yeah. it's only the federal cases yeah. or cases that tend to uh, at, uh, attack the constitution that will come to the Supreme Court level. Other than that, they are, they are nine, isn't it? Yes. And they will do their work. Because not every case that you walk through to the Supreme Court to, 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 to get a hearing. So I'm saying that one way to reduce the workload is to first relegate certain cases and stop certain cases from coming. Unless, of course, on appeal, every uh, citizens have a right to go to the highest possible court. That will help to reduce it. Secondly, I think our uh, justice system itself it's also overloaded because of the way cases are managed. You know, it takes the lawyers to tell you a uh, wheel, wheel of justice grinds right, slowly. slowly. Yeah. Then we also have a saying, justice delayed. It's justice denied. denied. So, which is so which? What, what, what is the balance for this? Yeah. Cases take years. And I, 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 is it because the shortage of the judges or just the way the judges uh, conduct cases? Mm. I think we need to have a real audit of cases at the court and f figure out why the delays and why the Supreme Court is overburdened, but not just on the surface argument that, look, we have too much work. How come we have too much work? How come the workload is so much? Let's do an audit and see. If we can address that, then there's no need to go to 20 or so before you can deal with cases. We can cap it at 12. All right. Thank you very much, My Professor Bafo Ajibandria. My pleasure. Uh, Always a pleasure speaking to you, and I always enjoy our conversations. And uh, sometimes you don't even want the time to end, you know. <laughs> but unfortunately, time is up, <laughs> time is up and we, we have to go. Professor Balfour Ajimandria, he's the CEO of the Kofor Foundation, uh, he's a governance expert, of course. Uh, he used to be UN advisor, and uh, he holds many, many portfolios. And uh, I call him a national treasure, Professor oh, Balfour Ajimandria. Thank you. National treasure. Uh, on that note, we'll wrap up GH. Um, hmm. Hmm. <laughs> you see? <laughs> on that note, we'll wrap up the morning star here on Star Y03.5 FM. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in. My name is Lantan Papanko. Uh, coming up next is the zone.